commerce, prudence, industry. This was the motto of Winnipeg beginning in 1873. And certainly this was the basic idea of how the city should be run by the business leaders who are also the politicians. So their idea of a smooth running society was that business would take charge, they would become profitable, they would provide jobs and everything else would work itself out. It was really that simple. Now, I don't know how prudent the original business leaders actually were. There were some booms and busts and a lot of speculation, but certainly commerce and industry were a big part of their ideology. But of course, this didn't necessarily work out for everyone in the same way. And by the time 1919 rolled around, there were a lot of problems for working people in Winnipeg. And that's what we're going to talk about today in Strike 101, which is really the 101st anniversary of the Winnipeg General Strike, today, May 15th. So come on in, we're gonna take a look at some artifacts. Uh, so here we have some artifacts related to some workers in uh, Winnipeg and their unions. A union at the time was really uh, a collection of uh, tradespeople who were specially trained and had very specialized jobs. And uh, it helped them organize and negotiate with their employers. But during the First World War, the ability to negotiate was taken away from them uh, because they felt that in wartime production, they needed everybody to work together and there couldn't be labor disputes. So now it was after the war, and they wanted the ability to negotiate again, but business leaders were naturally um, wanting to avoid this. So these are some of the objects and the unions that were in Winnipeg at the time. So this is the Bricklayers and Masons International Union of America, and you see a trowel, a plumb bob, and a brick there, along with their, un their union ribbon. And the ribbons identified people as part of the union when they were at meetings. Uh, another one is number four there, the International Brotherhood of Blacksmiths and Blacksmiths Helpers. Um, but there were also a lot of non-unionized people who were really struggling at the time uh, to make ends meet, uh, to have enough to eat, uh, to pay rent. And this included a lot of women who were working at the time as well. Uh, women were involved in the telephone um, service. They were involved in uh, textile factories all over uh, the, uh, the city and then also in the service industries. And so things were getting tougher and tougher for employees. And there are a lot of reasons for that. One is that there was a depression recently in Winnipeg, an economic depression in 1913, which is really hard to get out of. The other was that um, World War I had just ended and a lot of soldiers were coming back and there weren't really enough jobs for everyone. And the other is that you know, wages had just been flat for so long, people were having a really hard time making ends meet. And the pandemic couldn't have helped either. The 1918 influenza um, came in three waves through Winnipeg. Uh, it shut down businesses, just like it's doing to us now. Um, and that could not have helped the situation very much either and really put people on edge and worried about their future. So what workers decided to do to force employers to negotiate was to hold a general strike. And interestingly, the general strike happened May 15th, 1919, a mere six to eight weeks after the third wave of the influenza pandemic ended. So you can imagine that if that had still been raging, the strike might never have happened. And it was just a couple months afterwards and the weather was really nice. So follow me, we're gonna take a look at some other things. Now you've noticed during all our lockdowns and shutdowns because of the pandemic, that only a few businesses were open the whole time. One of those was the pharmacy. You could always go to your pharmacist and get the medication you needed. And it was the same during the strike too. During the general strike, many, many businesses were shut down by the workers themselves. Over 30,000 workers um, marched and, and stopped going to work, but the pharmacists remained open by permission of the strike committee. And so that's what we have here. They put up these signs permitted by authority of strike committee onto businesses that were allowed to stay open and then wouldn't be bothered by striking workers. If you want to come in, you can take a look. Some of you right, might remember 
our wonderful old pharmacy. It's a favorite for a lot of people. It's got a unique smell in here. And uh, of course, there's the permitted by authority of the strike committee sign and our pharmacist who owns the pharmacy. And uh, these kinds of services, everyone realized were really, really important. And there were a few things that the strike committee could keep going. But this enraged uh, the business leaders of the community because they thought they were in charge. They had been for decades. They were in charge of business and politics. And all of a sudden, strikers were going to tell them what to do. Another really uh, important part of uh, the strike scene was what was uh, called the Labor Cafe. And it was set up in the Strathcona restaurant. Now this restaurant was actually located where the Manitoba Museum is located today. And it was a place that was commandeered by strike leaders, in particular Helen Armstrong, to uh, provide free meals to striking women. There were a lot of women that went on strike. They weren't part of unions. They didn't have a lot of money. They got paid a lot less than men. And a lot of their wages went straight to food and rent. They didn't have a lot of extra. So when they went on strike, they just stopped getting paid. How were they gonna make ends meet? And so this labor cafe allowed them to eat for free and they were giving, given tickets to do that. So it was a really important gathering place uh, and a really important source of support for the striking community. Now we're gonna head off to the labor cafe. I just wanna point out the sign, the la sorry, the labor temple. We have a lot of comments about this sign because labor is spelt wrong. At the time in Canada, in Winnipeg, this is how labor was spelled, L-A-B-O-R. I know everybody wants to spell it O-U-R and that's correct today, but at the time, this is how it was spelled. So come on in. Now the labor temple, which is this building here, was located right behind where the museum is now, right about where the non-such is. And this is where labor leaders met to decide and vote with their community on the next steps in the labor dispute. And uh, it really inspired a lot of people because they came up with a lot of ideas really quickly and a lot of them worked really well, like the labor cafe. Um, but they also met, because there were so many people involved, they also met outside in Victoria Park, also behind the museum. And this, these were amazing gatherings. There were sometimes more than 5,000 people in that park. And you can see a great picture of them here. And it's hard to imagine any of us doing this right now because of uh, COVID-19. But at the time, they had just come out of their own pandemic and they, they were ready to gather. Uh, the weather was beautiful. They had um, a really important cause and they came together in these large groups to support that cause. All right, come with me. Now we're gonna talk about some of the opposition to uh, the cause of labor at the time. You can see here, these are the special police on horseback and they're charging strikers. Who are the special police? Let's talk about that for a minute. When the laborers went, uh, started their general strike, uh, there was panic really among the business leaders. All their factories were shut down, all their businesses were shut down, um, but they wanted to keep society going. They also had just recently all been reading about the Bolshevik revolution in Russia. And that civil war was still going on while this general strike happened. So they used that fear to um, really blame the strikers trying to overthrow the government, both local and uh, provincial and, and federal, in fact. And uh, they tried to blame people who were from other countries that had come to Canada more recently. And this is a constant theme we see in society over time. A lot of Eastern Europeans were blamed for taking part in the strike and trying to overthrow Canadian society and make it a communist society. So they started something called the Citizens Committee of 1000, which is really actually about 40 men uh, who are business leaders and a very secretive group. Uh, and only came out many, many years later who, what their names actually were. And they were lawyers and industry leaders. And they tried to figure out a way to stop the strike, not just stop it, but crush it. So it would never, ever happen again. Because uh, they didn't ever want to see this kind of disruption. 
It was all about status quo. And so they used a couple of methods. One was propaganda. They started their own uh, citizen newspaper, uh, which told all kinds of uh, really bizarre stories about uh, the strike and the strikers, many lies. Um, but they also started to worm their way into the minds of some of uh, the federal government leaders and trying to convince them that this was a revolution and that they needed to stop it by sending in some armed forces. But until that point, they decided to start the special police. Now, the, Win the regular Winnipeg police force had resigned en masse because they supported the strikers and they didn't want to fight against them, even though that's what the mayor and the business leaders wanted. Uh, so the Citizens Committee made their own police force. And most of these young men were 16 to 20, 22 years old. Not all of them, but most of them. And they were boisterous and ready for action. So if you want to turn around here and take a look, the special police used clubs like you see there, and they used um, blackjacks, very lethal uh, instruments that easily hidden in a, in a suit jacket pocket. Um, they're leather, they're flexible, and inside you have metal, uh, like nuts and bolts, and this can kill a person. Uh, some of them also had guns. And uh, so they went into the crowds, uh, a crowd of strikers, and they would start these fights. And the first time they did that, the strikers won, um, and you know, actually, you know, got a lot of, I guess, inspiration out of that. Uh, but they continued to harass them and, uh, and use their clubs and got into uh, a couple of fights. And the strikers really took, um, it took this hard because they were a peaceful group. The strikers were peaceful. They, were, um, they did not start fights. They did not want to get involved in fights. Um, but sometimes when the truncheons came out, of these young guys who were spoiling for a fight, then the strikers would fight back by picking up what was locally available. So their weapons tended to be bricks, bottles, and brick bats, which are sort of broken up bricks, easier to throw. And they would throw them at the special police and their horses to disrupt them. But again, they didn't bring weapons. This is just stuff they picked up off the ground. When push came to shove, the federal government agreed with uh, the Citizens Committee and they sent in the army. And this was really a shocking moment for all Canadians and all Winnipeggers and certainly the strikers, many of whom were uh, in the army themselves in World War I and had come back and were looking for work and supported the strikers. So when those veterans, and this was a veterans march on the 21st when this happened, uh, were met on the street by uh, armed um, soldiers and and vehicles with machine guns, uh, they were just in total shock that this would happen. And they dispersed after a fight and shots were fired, also by the Northwest Mounted Police. Um, it was pretty chaotic. Now the army only came in afterwards to clean up and they didn't fire shots, but they were sort of the presence that let everybody know that this was it, it's over. And they did that by threatening ex extreme violence. But that wasn't the end of the strike. It was the end of that battle. It was the end of the 1919 general strike. Um, but there's a very particular reason that that um, uh, march happened on June 21st. And that's because the strike leaders had been arrested from their homes recently. And those leaders were not, um, they were not violent people. Some of them were ministers. They were social activists. They were politicians. They were people that you would know throughout your whole life in the community. Um, but they were really taken as political prisoners. So if you want to come with me, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, as we walk, I want to show you this, uh, this footage that you can see on this building here. This is the only known footage of the general strike. Uh, it's great to have, and so we wanted to show it as big as we could on our uh, walls here. So this is a replica of a famous sign in a photograph that um, you see that happened after the strike in September. And all the leaders were still in jail. And it says prison bars cannot confine ideas. And that's really how 
a lot of the strike supporters felt. They felt that they had lost the battle of the strike and, and really gained nothing from it. Um, their ideas mattered. And those weren't going to die just because the strike did. And so the leaders in jail and on trial, um, they went different ways. Some of them were released from jail. Some of them, the charges were dropped, but many stayed in jail for six months to a year. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, of course, a, a good experience for anyone. But when they came out of jail, they started to get active. And the community support was there for them to do that. So now we're going to take a little hike up to the second floor. Many of you have probably been up there before. We get a special view from up there. Another thing that happened after the strike was a royal commission was begun by the province of Manitoba to try and understand what the causes of the strike were. And they found that the, the fault really lay squarely on the employers, that they were profiteering, they did not pay their people enough wages, uh, they gave them poor working conditions. And the business leaders were very upset with this. Here they had won this battle of the strike. The strike leaders were in jail, but yet they were actually being accused of being the problem. So this gave people hope that the government had actually put together a document that said things have to change in one way or another. It didn't go too far. It just said, you know, you business leaders should change your ways. That doesn't always happen. And nothing was going to force them to do that. So what happened was the business leader or the strike leaders that were in jail, when they came out, many of them went into politics and they actually became quite successful. Some of them were mayors of Winnipeg uh, or MLAs for the province or members of parliament for Winnipeg Centre, some of them for 20 years. And that's because they had a lot of support and were seen as political um, prisoners by most people. Uh, so the effect of the, um, the strike in the end was not much at the beginning when, when the strike ended itself, but over time, these political leaders were able to institute really important changes in society, changes that we're relying on today during the pandemic. So think of employment insurance. These leaders helped institute that through politics. Uh, old age pension, which they introduced in 1927, by um, uh, siding with the liberals and getting some power there to institute this new change. Um, child benefit, uh, Medicare, all of these things that all of us in Canada, millions of people are relying on today just to make ends meet and get through this crisis uh, came out of the Winnipeg general strike. So thanks very much. And I was just wondering if anybody had any questions at this time. Doesn't look like it right now. So thanks very much for joining us. Hope you liked the tour. There's one question, were there any indigenous people involved? Uh, it's likely that there were on the ground in terms of being strikers um, because Indigenous people would have been involved in um, some of the work in the city, in factories, etc. Um, it doesn't come out in a lot of the history or the written narrative of the strike, um, but that's certainly something that is, I think, open for uh, further study by scholars in the future. I think that's a really, really good question. We have a couple other questions, Roland. Um, okay. One person wants to know about the tram car or the streetcar. Okay. So the streetcar was uh, stopped outside City Hall and uh, everybody got out. Um, and it was really after um, the Northwest Mounted Police showed up and started trying to break up the strikers that strikers got very upset and um, they saw the streetcar going by and they, they felt, you know, it really shouldn't be running. And uh, so 
once people were had gotten out of it, they um, set it on fire. Uh, first, they tried to tip it over, and that's the that's the picture you often see. Yeah, of it, but it was so heavy because the axles at the bottom were really really heavy, um, weighing some tons. They couldn't quite get it over, so they just set it on fire instead. Sort of a sad moment for everyone in Winnipeg. Uh, speaking of sad moments, we also have a question. Can you speak to the people who died during the strike? Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Siklowiski and Mike Shabanowicz died during the strike. Siklowiski was shot on William Avenue, which is right between uh, the Global uh, Peterson Food, uh, I guess, school, and where City Hall is now. Uh, he was gunned down there and died immediately. And then Sherbanowicz died later of his wounds. There is one photograph uh, which seems to show four people carrying a body across Main Street in the distance. And we think that might be uh, one of those gentlemen. Uh, yes, so there were people that died during that, but there were also dozens of others who were hospitalized during the riots, um, some with quite serious wounds. Another related question is um, that they heard that there were cannons mounted on the south bank of the Assiniboine River. Have you heard of this? Is this true? I have not heard of that myself. Doesn't mean that it isn't true, but it certainly hasn't come up in any of my readings. Uh, we also have a question. Were there any um, Black Canadians involved in the strike? Absolutely. Uh, there was the um, uh, Car Porters group. Uh, there was a union. And they had started just before the strike in the 1910s. Uh, and so these were people working on the trains as car porters. And this was a traditionally Black American, Black Canadian uh, employment route for people. And they had started a union. And during the strike, they um, said that they would join and support the strikers and the other unions. Um, and this was a really important moment for them as a group. And the strikers were you know, very pleased by this. Before that, black men were not allowed into these other unions because of their race. Um, and then during the strike, there was this new feeling of solidarity. Unfortunately, after the strike, those old habits went back into play. We have another question. Um, can you speak about, uh, say anything more about Hell's Alley and anything you'd like to share would be welcome. Mm. Hell's Alley, that was sort of the, the crucible for, for the riots on June 21st. And that was an alley uh, which is where the, um, the concert hall is now, Steinkopf Gardens, that area. And um, basically there were um, special police uh, around where the Manitoba Museum is right now, um, standing across Main Street, and then you had Royal Northwest Mounted Police at the other end, and you had all these strikers milling around in the middle. And the special police, always fixing for a fight, uh, started um, a fight with some of the strikers. That spilled over into Hell's Alley, and unfortunately there are no photographs of that moment, but there are many stories, and that's where a lot of those dozens of injuries occurred. Gunshots in there, clubs, uh, blackjacks, bricks, bottles. It was uh, pretty bad. Um, we have a student viewing who asked if the special police still exist and how or how long did they last? Hmm. No, they don't exist anymore. They ended with the ending of the strike. So they were just around for about four or five weeks. Um, another question, where did the Citizens Committee of 1000 meet, or do you want to sit, speak to them at all? Yes, uh, the Citizens Committee of 1000 met at um, the Industrial Bureau Exposition Building, which doesn't exist anymore. It's a building on Main Street, uh, and it showed off, it was like a, a museum at the time to show off the industries of, of Manitoba. There was also a little concert hall in there and some displays of various things, and that's where they would meet. They even had a sign up front which was then torn down by some strikers. It was one of many contentious sites in the city at the time. Okay. 
Um, another question, uh, were any of the union leaders uh, um, who did not preach sedition or violence? Um, and, um, sorry. So, sorry, can you say that again? Sorry. The question is, uh, were any of the union leaders uh, like not preaching sedition or violence is the question. Y yes, uh, the, the union leaders and strike leaders were, none of them were um, preaching violence. They were all on the pacifist side of things in terms of the, uh, the actual strike. They said, you know, do not respond to violence. If the police strike you, do not strike back. Um, and so, and the whole thing about seditious libel, which is basically a fancy way of saying that you are um, besmirching the state, you're saying bad things about the state of Canada, um, that really was just clamping down on their free speech to um, criticize the way society was working at the time. And one more just follow-up question to the Hell's Alley question before. Okay. Um, uh, Katie says, I've heard that a wagon was wheeled up to one end to block the exit of the strikers. Is there any evidence to support that? I have not seen evidence to support that. That may very well be true. Another question. Um, okay. When did sort of the next labor unrest or strikes happen in Winnipeg? Oh, uh, there were numerous labor unrests after that, even in the 20s, but nothing on that scale. It was mostly one union, one industry, uh, one set of employers. Um, I'm not sure exactly when the next one happened. And um, do you know if any of the special police or businessmen were ever arrested during the strike? None of them were that I know of. They were sometimes put on the hot seat during the trials of the, uh, of the strikers themselves and during the commission, but certainly no one was ever arrested. So thank you so much, Roland, for this present today. I think we've gotten to all of the questions. And uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, if, I don't know if everybody realizes that this is the exact uh, 101st anniversary of the beginning of the strike.